From the outside, this hive looks fine. There's nectar carriers coming in, there's pollen carriers coming in, there's guards. They're cleaning the hive. All normal activity. But there's something very wrong with this hive and you won't know unless you go into it. Or if you wait long enough, then you'll see the decimating effects it can have. Not just this colony, but all the others as well. Stay tuned, I'm gonna continue my hive inspection series. This time I'm starting to look at hive diseases Whenever you see a spotty brood pattern, I'm going to go through the signs of American fowl brood. Hey everybody, today we're talking about American fowl brood and really what we're doing is we're continuing our hive inspection series and we have now come to the part of the hive inspection where you, uh, you're queen right, you have a good queen, but your brood pattern is spotty. So why is it spotty? Well, there's a lot of reasons for brood patterns to be spotty and all of them are bad signs usually. There's one exception and that is that when you have a brand new comb, wired foundation, uh, queens don't like to lay on those wires so much. So you'll, it's actually a solid frame of brood, but you can actually see lines where the wires are. Uh, after two or three or four uh, rounds of brood in there, it becomes smoother because they go, they go in and they clean that in with propolis and, and beeswax and they clean it up and they prepare it for the queen. And then, then you start to see solid brood everywhere. So that's the one exception, but it's, it's not really a spotty brood pattern. Spotty brood patterns are indicative of shotgun types brood everywhere, brood surrounded by uh, brood that is different age. So you'll see an egg next to a mature larva or an egg next to cat brood or something like that. And it will be inconsistent. Let me give you a little history of American fowl brood. It was discovered in 1906 by a scientist named G.F. White, an American scientist. It's not related to European fowl brood. European fowl brood was a, was a bacterial uh, infection that was discovered in Europe by a European scientists, and that's the only reason it's referred to as American and European fowl brood. The fowl brood part of the name is because sometimes and at some stages you have the smell of decay in the hive. Uh, the only thing they have in common is that they are bacteria and they infect honeybee larvae. So American fowl brood, uh, the history is that it was discovered in 1906. Uh, there was no treatments other than burning the hive at that time. And this went on for quite a while actually. In 1944, a scientist, not sure of his name, discovered that sulfathiazole, which is a sulfa drug, which is what you get when you get a bacterial infection, uh, sulfathiazole was useful in treating American fowl brood. Now, I'm gonna go real quick through the antibiotic history and then I'm going to explain the mechanisms by which those antibiotics work and their limitations. And by the way, just so you're, if you're, if you're watching this video and you think that I'm going to talk about uh, uh, telling you to use antibiotics, I'm not advocating one over the other. I'm giving you information. You use, with, you use the information as you see fit. Antibiotics, sulfathiazole kills the vegetative state of American fowl brood, as does teramycin, lincomycin, and tylosin. Those are all antibiotics approved for use save one, sulfathiazole, was discontinued and made illegal in the U.S. in 1978. Uh, all the others, are, it is still legal to use. American fowl brood is a spore-forming bacteria, which means that when, when a bacteria is in its vegetative state, which is how you usually see it pictured under microscopes, kind of long and skinny, uh, that is when it does, it da it does the damage. However, when all of a sudden environmental conditions become untenable for that bacteria, spore forming bacteria can change into a spore or an endospore. So that kind of divides into two pieces and one becomes a spore and the other basically dies off. But all the genetic material is, is reserved in the spore. The spore has a hard outer shell or shells that resist it from high temperatures, low temperatures, chemicals, all those types of things, and these spores can last for 100 years or more. Uh, 
there's a lot of different types of spore forming bacteria. A good example of for, for humans, a good parallel is the botulism spore, uh, which can also live in honey. Spores can live in honey because honey keeps it dormant. Spores are basically dormant forms of bacteria. And that is why on, on, a, on a honey jar it says, do not use with infants under a year of age. Because that botulism spore can be suspended in honey and then vectored into the body through eating the honey. And since an infant one year of age or younger doesn't have the immune system that an adult has or, or even a two year old, uh, that botulism spore can germinate and, and we will have a bacterial infection to which antibiotics will be used to kill it. However, there's never been a case reported, an actual documented case of botulism being transmitted to a human being through the medium of eating honey. But since the possibility exists, that's why we have that. In 1978, it was discovered that sulfa drugs were in honey. So they discontinued use in the US anyway, and they went to teramycin. Both of them were used prophylactically as is the new drug lincomycin, according to Ross Conrad's nat Natural Beekeeping. Um, and tylosin is used only when you have an outbreak. The antibiotics, all of them, kill the vegetative state of American fowl brood. But when American fowl brood produces this endosporm, and that endosporm then uh, is protected from any type of antibiotic. And that, that's true in, with, with whatever spore-forming bacteria you're talking about. It doesn't have to be an AFB. Uh, it could be any, it like, could be botulism, could be a lot of different spore-forming bacteria. They're very dangerous. And that's their survival mechanism, is, is going into this spore stage. Most research that I've seen for over 20 years has said that there are American fowl brood spores in all hives. And American fowl brood is everywhere on, the, everywhere on every continent where bees are kept. So to say that you don't have spores in your beehives is, is probably an overstatement because you probably have the spores. Hygienic bees can get rid of those spores and good comb rotation techniques. We'll talk about control in a second. So that's it for basically the history. Uh, lincomycin, by the way, I didn't know, I, I, I've never even heard that it was approved in the US, but according to Ross Conrad's Natural Beekeeping, and I'll give some references at the end of the video here, uh, he says it's another approved antibiotic. So we will talk really quick about how AFB infects and kills larvae. And I'm gonna compare it to EFB because they're confused quite often. Okay, in the life of a bee, as it's growing from an egg to an adult, you, it, it, the queen lays the egg and it hatches after about three days. That's a one day old larva when it hatches. And you'll see little tiny larva in the back of the cell, suspended on a bed of royal, royal jelly. From one day to about three days, actually 53 hours of larval life, is when they can be infected with American fowl brood bacteria spores also, it can be affected with European fowl brood. However, European fowl brood is not a spore-forming bacteria, so it can be controlled with all those antibiotics to, to the fullest extent. After about 53 hours, if, if the, the larva has not been infected, it has now become immune to American fowl brood spores and European fowl brood, as far as I know, as well. It was infected in that one to three day period, but American fowl brood was infected as a spore. That being the case, it takes longer for that spore. That spore has to then germinate and then infect the developing brood before it actually starts to kill it. That being the case, American fowl brood affects pre-pupa and pupa stage developing brood. European fowl brood affects the larva. Since it's already vegetative state, it affects it right away. So that's the biggest glaring difference between the two is that, that European fowl brood, will, you will see it with larva, American fowl brood, the cells will already usually be capped.
what are you what are you looking for when you're looking for American fowl brood? The first thing is a shotgun brood pattern, but that's the same with a lot of diseases. A shotgun brood pattern is the same with EFB or with AFB. It's even the same with varroa mites. So what distinguishes AFB from EFB? One, it affects pre-pupa and pupa, not larva. So if, you're see, if you see brown dead dying larva, you're probably looking at EFB and that'll be in the next video. AFB affects pupa. The cell has already been sealed. Because it kills the, the pre-pupa or the pupa after the cell has been sealed, a lot of the time the cell capping will become sunken. That's an indication that there's something wrong with that cell, that, that that brood is dead. If it continues to go, if, if you don't have a hygienic stock or you have susceptible stock, you actually see dark brown, almost black, oozing goo coming out of those cells. The cell cappings will look kind of greasy from that happening in the first place. So as the, as the pre-pupa and the pupa kind of melt into this mucousy, gluish looking thing, uh, as it decays, it becomes liquid and it starts to come through the cells. Uh, good bees have noticed, good nurse bees have noticed that, hey, there's something wrong with the cell, so they will sometimes go in and they will puncture the cell to see what's going on, try to clean it out. So you'll see cell cappings that are sunken and perforated. Now with varroa mites, you, you may see perforated cells, but you don't usually see sunken cells and they're not that dark, greasy, black looking color. So oftentimes this diagnosis is made with uh, uh, varroa mite in mind. It's actually, if they're sunken and greasy looking, you have American fowl brood. European fowl brood as well. You'll, you could see some perforated cappings, but since it doesn't affect pupil stage bees, the cappings are normal. The capped cells are normal. They're, they're still slightly domed. They're not sunken. And uh, it's the larvae that you see that are dead. When you're looking at a comb, straight on, you're looking to the back of the cell, all right? You're looking at the part where it's, it's actually the foundation rib that goes in between. That's where the egg is deposited in the back of the cell. At the bottom of the cell, you have the bottom, the sides, the top, all that. The bottom of the cell, you will notice scales uh, with, but with both AFB and EFB. And I think this is why they are sometimes confused. But in order to actually see that, it's best to look down, through, down the top bar to the bottom bar and look at the bottom of the cells. If you see scales down there, try to remove them. If they're, if they're so stuck on the bottom of the cell that you cannot remove them, that is indicative of American fowl brood. European fowl brood scales are there, but you can pull them out pretty easy with a toothpick or a matchstick or a little piece of wood, whatever you have available. Uh, if they're sticky and hard uh, and, it, and it destroys the comb to get it out, that is unique to American fowl brood. Those are the scales. And what the scales are is that as, as the pre-pupa or the pupal brood decay, they sink down to the bottom of the cell, not the back of the cell, but the bottom of the cell. They sink down to the bottom of the cell and they just kind of, they just kind of turn into this mush. Now, European fowl brood scales do the same thing, but they, they have larva in there and that larva just kind of slides around and then and then dies right there. But you can get that out usually in one piece with, with EFB. Both of, both of the foul broods, of course, can smell foul. It's not always, it, it doesn't rule it out if you can't smell it. There was also something called the pupil tongue. Now, only usually seen about five to 10% of the time anyway, but what it is is as that, lar as that pre pupa, it's an older stage pupa, I believe, that dies off and so, Sometimes the, you get the tongue, which I'm not sure if it's actually the proboscis or the tongue of the bee, but you get something that looks like the proboscis hanging from the top of the cell, and then, and then it goes down vertically, and then you get the scale in the bottom. Pupil tongue is also, that's also unique only to American fowl brood. You will not see that with EFB or any other disease. But just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. Another thing you look for is the ropey test. Now, as, as that pupa dies, it changes from white 
to tan to brown to black. When it's in the brown stage, and you gotta uncap some cells, when it's in the brown stage, or, or it's oozing out of the cell cappings, take a, uh, a match, a light, uh, you know, whatever, a piece of wood, stir the contents around and then, and then slowly pull it out. If it, if it ropes out just a half inch or three quarters of an inch, that is indicative of American foul brood. What you'll find with EFB is that when you try to rope it out, it'll, the whole thing will just come out, the whole dead larva. Uh, so if you get the ropey test, if you, if you see the ropiness, uh, that is also a positive AFB diagnosis. Now, the reason you may not see it is because as the, as the pupa dies, there's only a, a, a certain stage where that ropiness will occur. After that, it's too liquid. Before that, it's too solid. So you'll get the whole pupa come out or you'll get, you know, just, you'll just get liquid coming out. And it won't be the entire thing either. It'll just be, it'll just be whatever is on your stick there. Then there's also the Holst milk test. Now this I didn't learn about. It was invented in 1946 by a scientist named Holst. Uh, I don't know much about him, but I read about it in Ross Conrad's book, Natural Beekeeping. But here's all I have. I have a test tube with just a little bit of powdered milk, just a pinch of powdered milk in there. Okay. I don't have a test tube holder, so bear with me. And then I have a second test tube. We're going to, I'm going to fill this test tube with that pinch up to about here. I'm going to mix it up well, and then I'm going to pour half of it into this test tube. So I'll have the same mixture of, uh, of basically milk in in the test tubes. Okay, so now I've added water. There are a little bit different levels there, but one is going to be a control, one's going to be uh, the actual test. Okay, I'm going to take a toothpick and I'm going to remove a scale from this frame. And the scales are those things, remember I showed you that you have to look at the bottom of the hive with, and I'm just going to take, they're hard to get off, and that's another symptom, remember, of American Fowl Brood. And I'm going to drop it in one of the test tubes. And you can see there, there's the scale there on the bottom. So then you just wait about 10 to 15 minutes and we'll see if anything happens. You can kind of see the color change already. It's only been just a couple minutes. Uh, but that's basically what, like, if you have EFB, that's what it'll look like. Uh, it, it won't be translucent. It'll still be kind of uh, off-white in color. But you can see the difference, the change in color from the control to the test solution. Okay, so you can see the result. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how long it took, you know, for this solution to become clear, but you can see the control is just, you know, is white, and then the this is more transparent. You can see the toothpick all the way through. So uh, there's some sediment on the bottom. That's I'm sure that's just debris, but uh, that is a positive result for American foul root. That's the Holst milk test. If you get a positive result with the Holst milk test, you, you also have AFB. If you get a negative result or an EFB result, then that doesn't mean that all you have is EFB. Look for all the other signs that I've given you because you can have American foul brood and European foul brood in the same hive. And most of the cases I've seen in the past with other beekeepers hives, that's exactly what I saw. And the reason is, is because American foul brood stresses the bees and European foul brood is a stress disease. They become susceptible to that bacteria because they're stressed out, because of other factors that are affecting them. So you can see both American and European foul brood in the same hive. And there are distinct differences. We'll get to that in the next video. Okay, so you're inspecting your hives. You come, you come upon a hive that has a spotty brood pattern. You look for the signs of American foul brood and you find them. What do you do next? First thing is, is that the hive tool that you used and the fingers you used uh, and the smoker that you used, that is all, has all just become infected. So you don't want to move on to the next hive without sanitizing that equipment. Uh, if you can wash your hands and then grab a different hive tool and a, and a different smoker or even uh, you know, the, the, the part of the smoker that's been infected is the bellows. So if you put, can put plastic gloves on or something, uh, when you use the smoker and then remove them when you're working the hive, you can do that as well. But just 
treat it like the plague because this stuff can spread from one hive to the next. It is a serious problem. And that's why hands-off beekeepers have been so criticized because hands-off beekeepers don't know they have American fowl brood. By the time they do know their hive is dead, it's been robbed out by other hives. And now those other hives have American fowl brood. So it is highly contagious. The reason that state bee inspectors came into being was because of American fowl brood. This was a serious disease. It still is a serious disease. You get it, you gotta burn all the equipment. So let's talk about control methods. Once you found it in your hive, what do you do? The best thing to do is to move that hive to a quarantined yard or a yard where there are no other beehives. But even that's risky because you don't know if there are wild colonies around or neighboring colonies or whatever. So you have to take action quick. Um, you can burn the entire hive with the bees in it, if, 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 if that's something you're comfortable doing. That's what the control was in 1906. In 1944, when sulfathiazole came on the market, the control was still so good, just burning the hive, that they really continued to use that, and they, they didn't use sulfathiazole that much as an antibiotic. There are now control methods other than just, you know, burning the entire hive. There are mechanical means, which is what I'm gonna to refer to as integrated pest management because it's mechanical and genetic mixed together. And we'll talk about that first because I think this is the way to go in the future. The bees themselves don't, they can carry the spores around, but it's more in the honey, the pollen, the comb, and the hive itself where those spores are located. So a newer control method and a better one, I think, at least it's a better option than other options, even though it's still a bad option, is to get brand new equipment with foundation or foundationless frames but with no foundation with with no comb in them uh, shake your bees into that hive and burn the rest of the equipment now you have to burn all the frames that's that's a no-brainer you burn all the frames wood and all wood and comb and everything the inside of the hive bodies can be scorched the lid the inner cover the bottom board all that can be scorched just make sure you really scorch it. One of the best methods is to basically coat it in turpentine and then light that turpentine on fire. Integrated pest management includes developing or getting resistant stalks to AFB and to mites. They're called hygienic bees or VSH bees um, or just hygienics in general. These bees have shown higher than average hygienic behavior. Now that doesn't mean that the bees of the past weren't hygienic. In fact, they're very hygienic. But the fact is, they weren't hygienic enough to deal with AFB or mites. Now they have to be. So there's a huge influx of bees on the market that are VSH certified, or Minnesota Hygienics is a good one, or they're hygienically service certified or whatever. You need to get resistant stock into your bees. That's the number one thing. The last part of it is that you have to get on a frame rotation uh, schedule so about every five years you need to rotate your frames out you don't have to do it all every five years but every every couple of years rotate comb out and put in fresh foundation that's also something that can keep your bees from swarming anyway so get on a frame rotation uh, schedule rotate old comb out and bring in new comb and that will that will really help especially with the resistant stock to keep American fowl brood at bay. Ross Conrad, again, from Natural Beekeeping, has stated that he's done this for 10 years, uh, AFB free, after having an outbreak uh, 10 years ago whenever he wrote his revised edition, I think. So that's the integrated pest management procedure for American fowl brood. There's one thing I wanna talk about. Integrated pest management for Varroa includes using ventilated uh, bottom boards. When you have American fowl brood and you have an, a ventilated bottom board, all that comb that collects under the hive, all that has AFB spores and can be spread outside the hive or underneath the hive. So in this case, you'll see that I use a solid bottom board because I don't want any of those spores from down below to get in the hive. Now I'm not saying they won't, but I'm gonna use the, the IPM strategies in addition. But that's one drawback to a ventilated uh, hive ventilated bottom board is that that comb that's down there, all the debris that falls out of the hive is also infected with AFB. If other bees or even a wax moth gets in there and 
picks up those spores and then flies into one of your hives. Now you got spores in that hive. So, but I said all along that getting the spores in your hives is kind of a uh, no brainer anyway, it's gonna happen. You're gonna get AFB. If, you've, if you do bees for long enough, as soon as you miss a step, you'll see a case of AFB. It's a serious disease. Okay, the last option is of course antibiotics. So antibiotics do kill the vegetative state of the bacteria. It's not fair to say that if you're, if you're given antibiotics, you're covering up the disease. The reason people say that is because you may have those spores in your hive, but you've, you've made the environment untenable for those spores, so those spores never germinate. They never spread. They don't go away either. But they don't affect the bees because a spore can't affect a, sp a spore by itself that never germinates is dormant. It, it's a dormant stage of bacteria. It doesn't affect anything. It's when it germinates that it causes a problem. And it germinates once the larva has, has uh, ingested it. But if the larva has also ingested s small amounts of uh, an antibiotic, that, sp that spore either won't germinate because it realizes it would die somehow, chemically, or it'll germinate and it will get killed. So antibiotics can control the disease. And I'm not, I, I'm not for or against antibiotics. Of course, I'd love a more organic approach to beekeeping. The same resistant properties that bacteria are becoming to with human beings are also happening with American fowl brood. So there are resistant strains of American fowl brood to teramycin. That's why according to new research, Lincomycin and tylosin were, were approved for use. Tylosin, again, is not a prophylactic treatment. Lincomycin can be. Uh, all of these can be used once you've found an infection. And in fact, you can use a number of different methods together. You can shake the bees out onto foundation and then give them a dusting of teramycin to kill any vegetative state bacteria that, that are in the hive. The problem is, is that antibiotics are a temporary uh, fix. So they do stay the disease. And for, for 20 years, you know, I didn't have any. And, and for most of that 20 years, about 15 of those years, I did treat with teramycin pro prophylactically in fall and spring. Never had an outbreak of AFB. I'm sure the AFB was in the hive, but it never had a chance to become an outbreak, to, to, be, uh, to affect the bees themselves. So antibiotic treatments are there too as, as a control method. Okay, just a few last thoughts on this. I started with AFB, one, because I have an example of it, and two, because I think it's the worst disease that beekeepers face. Yes, varroa mites are bad, and varroa mites give us other viruses and, and things of that nature, and then they can kill entire hives, but AFB can kill the entire hive, and you have to burn the equipment. With, with a varroa mite problem, the mites die when the hive dies. So you can repopulate the equipment. Uh, and then lastly, I want to give you a couple resources. In order of importance, I think, uh, the most, the, the best resource on American Fowl Brood is Dayton Publications, The Hive and the Honeybee, and get their newest version. It's an expensive book, but it really does help. When you, when you find a hive with a problem and you can't quite put a finger on it, this book helps as does the ABC and XYZ of bee culture. That's another classic. It's been, in, both of these been in print for more than 100 years. Of course, they've been updated. And so they have up-to-date information on d hive diseases, pests, uh, et cetera. Randy Oliver, who also writes for American Bee Journal, has a website called Scientific Beekeeping. And he has a good example of the, the Holst milk test for AFB and EFB. But he also has a good website that explains AFB and EFB and the differences and all that kind of stuff. So Randy Oliver's scientificbeekeeping.com. And then the last one uh, is, a, is a great resource and it's an easy read and that is um, Ross Conrad's Natural Beekeeping Organic Approaches to Modern Apiculture. That book is fantastic because he has real life experience with AFB and he decided to go the organic way and was successful. So if if that's where you're headed, and even if you're not, even if you're a beekeeper that doesn't 
necessarily is not trying to do organic beekeeping, but you're just trying to do successful beekeeping, read his book. It's a good book. Those are the four best resources on AFB. Other resources, even some of the books that I suggested in my, in my previous video, uh, are somewhat misleading on American foul brood. So get a number of resources before you, you know, before you delve into one. So, and, and just take their word for it. Anyway, I hope this was helpful. Uh, I know it's a, you find this in your hive, it's an awful thing to find. It's really disturbing. You might think that you did something wrong. That's not the case. This is a, you know, to say that would be to say that you did something wrong when you caught the flu. I think we're getting closer and closer to the days where it will become a thing of the past with resistant stock or with, uh, with hygienic stock that are resistant to both AFB and varroa mites. Have a good day. We'll see you on the next one.